everyone, and welcome to Behind the Numbers. My name is Dave Bookbinder, and this is the show where we dig deeper to understand what really matters most in business. Today, we're going to be talking about how to unlock business value with compliance. And I'm pleased to welcome Tom Fox, who's the founder of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hey, Tom, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Dave, thanks. I've been greatly looking forward to this uh, recording. I enjoy your podcast because of your approach of literally behind the numbers and thrilled to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. And, and you are a guy who hosts 50 shows of your own, which we're going to get to. So uh, I'm kind of in awe and starstruck of having you on the show. So, well, let's get after it, as they say. Uh, so you're, you're an attorney and you're known as the compliance evangelist. Tell us how you got so inspired about compliance. Sure. So in 2007, I became a general counsel of a company that uh, at that time had the largest fine in the history of the world ever for a law called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. That law makes illegal the payment of bribes uh, by U.S. companies uh, for, to foreign government officials and employees of state-owned enterprise. The fine and penalty was $27 million. It doesn't make the top 30 anymore. Uh, that was my first real exposure to compliance. And uh, what I found was uh, I was part of the new management team that got brought in to create a new compliance program and culture for the company. And I found I really enjoyed that. Inevitably, the company was sold and my job went away and I decided what I really wanted to do with my life uh, from the legal perspective was uh, build out compliance programs in organizations. That's what I really enjoyed. And I started that uh, consultancy in 2010. And back then there were very few lawyers who did that. Lawyers in the FCPA realm, as we call it, either did investigations or negotiated with the government. So I became the nuts and bolts guy. And what I found, Dave, was that there, the world loses $3 trillion annually to the international scourge of bribery and corruption. Two more trillion if you add in money laundering. Uh, and I felt like I could bring my skills and talents in a very small way, in a very small part of the international fight against that. So uh, I believe that compliance, compliance motivates me to uh, get out of bed every day and do this type of work. But then I began to realize, Dave, that compliance is not simply about following a law or fighting an international scourge. Effective compliance equates to more efficient business process, which equates to greater ROI. Uh, and that's what attracts me to people like yourself in the podcast realm, because you talk about those numbers. It took me a long time because I'm a lawyer, but I finally learned that their numbers behind compliance can drive business uh, growth expansion, greater ROI and greater productivity. So kind of packaging all that together, I see compliance as the good news for businesses because I see it as a business process. An evangelist in ancient Greek was literally the bringer of the good news. So I call myself the compliance evangelist. Well, I appreciate that backstory. And we're definitely gonna unpack the, the ROI and, and how to unlock business value. But first I wanna start with uh, defining compliance, Tom. It, it's more than just financial controls or business processes, is that right? Uh, well, we can start with that because the basis of modern compliance is actually Sarbanes-Oxley and SOX 404 to be specific, which requires not only financial controls, but it requires uh, business executives, CFOs and CEOs to certify those numbers. So uh, that was the gift we got from Enron and WorldCom was uh, Sarbanes-Oxley and building from there, uh, compliance controls are essentially financial controls. And that's why I say that effective compliance will equate, equate to more efficient business process because properly seen compliance are financial controls. Of course, compliance has a legal uh, and regulatory uh, component, and that's to actually follow the laws and prevent your company from engaging in bribery, corruption, or other activities that would violate various federal laws. So. Uh, really, you have to put two of those together. You have to put the financial controls, the internal controls that every business should have together with uh, the more overarching or um, uh, overview of legal and regulatory compliance. Yeah. And, and is there a certain point in a company's evolution, Tom, when 
they should have someone who is dedicated as a called a chief compliance officer? Well, if I go back to Sarbanes-Oxley, Dave, I think every business needs robust financial controls, literally out of the box. I think that's the backbone of every business in America, probably across the world, but uh, in America, having effective financial controls allows you to grow your business. It allows you to garner investment money, whether that be a bank loan, whether that be private equity funding, whether you decide to go public. So having robust financial controls is absolutely mandatory. Building out from there, if you have financial controls, I tell people that compliance controls, uh, if you have financial adequate financial controls, you're 95% of the way there, maybe even 98%. So to take that step to having effective compliance, if you have adequate financial controls, is not a difficult or hard step. Uh, I advocate really any time certainly by the time you have 500 million in sales but uh, probably closer to 100 million in sales depending on your industry uh, then you can have compliance controls and someone paying attention to that but if you have already implemented robust financial controls it's not going to be a, a long hard stretch for you yeah one of the things as you're talking about that that comes to my mind is the, the concept of the segregation of duty so you don't have all the same hands in a cookie jar, so to speak. How does that dovetail with compliance, if at all? Sure, segregation of duties is one of the absolute keys in financial controls. And as you said, it simply means that the person who approves a third party vendor is not the same person who contracts with that third party vendor, who is not the same person that approves the payments to that third party vendor. And that's as basic an internal control as you uh, can have and it's uh, more than necessary financial control. So if you have uh, segregation of duties, uh, that's a great start, and it's something that every uh, small company should start with as literally as soon as they can. I recognize if you're a micro company, that may be difficult, but a segregation of duties is one of the most basic internal controls uh, that you can have in place. Yeah, and, and, and Tom, just is it, possible to create an environment where your compliance protocols are so tight that you never have any violations or is there still ways to worm around that well unfortunately dave companies are made up of human beings and human beings not only can make mistakes they do make mistakes and part of that is what are they incentivized to do so if you are a 100 percent sales commissioned employee uh, guess what? If you want any money, you got to make sales. And that's where people start to cut corners. So you have to watch out on the sales side. How are you incentivizing or incenting people to do business? Part of it is the culture of your organization. If your top management or your CEO or your president of your $100 million company says, guys, we are not paying bribes, period. Not on my watch. I don't care what you do. Well, that message, you know, if you talk that talk and walk that walk, that message gets down. But it's really how you run your business. Do you incentivize or disincentivize people? Uh, and then not simply having policies, procedures that you train on, but monitoring the effects uh, of those in your overall risk management scheme. Yeah, and part of that risk management scheme that you're referring to is the internal piece, right? But what about the importance of external advisors? When you, when you mentioned things like uh, Enron and WorldCom, uh, we've got external advisors that are involved in those circumstances. Sometimes they don't see everything that's going on. Eventually it, it does catch up to folks, but talk a bit about the, the importance of the good external advisors as a watchdog here. Sure, and Enron is the perfect example to give because if our listeners will recall, in the summer of, uh, I think, 2000, 2001, Sharon Watkins wrote a memo to the president, then CEO Ken Lay, saying, I think we have some accounting problems. And uh, please hire someone to review our accounting protocols, but do not hire the company that wrote those. Well, the company that wrote those was the law firm of Vincent and Elkins. And Vincent and Elkins got hired to review the work it had done for Exxon. Uh, in 2024, Dave, if you ask me to review my work that I've done for a company, I can tell you the answer now. I don't need to review it. It was great. Yeah. And so you have to have an internal advisor 
excuse me, an external advisor who is disinterested, uh, you cannot review your own work, period. Uh, that's just uh, a basic, uh, a basic uh, protocol and having external advisors who can review in a dispassionate, rational way and present their findings to management is absolutely key. And frankly, that's the reason we have external auditors or a CPA to come in and look at your books as opposed to doing it internally. Yeah, I mean, look, I've got to play within rules as a valuation professional. If my accounting firm is doing an audit for a client, I can't do the valuation and have numbers wind up on a balance sheet that we're auditing. So it just does not work that way. So totally understand that piece. Um, I remember about the, uh, the Enron situation back in the day and looking at them, they were a highly touted stock. Everybody was talking about them as a big growth story. And the more management talked, the less I understood about what they were really doing. Were you able to understand uh, it at, at the time or was the whole thing just part of the big ruse? The whole thing was a part of the big ruse. Uh, first of all, anyone who asked questions, the answer was, well, you're just too stupid to understand. Right. And that came from the COO, Jeff Skilling, who became the CEO. The second thing was the day before numbers were reported, uh, Skilling would uh, tell the uh, CFO, Andy Fastow, here's the number I want to hit back into it. So that's really not the way it's supposed to work. Uh, your numbers are supposed to give you uh, what your overall profitability was. And so literally the whole thing was a house of cards from day one. And eventually uh, they got caught because they couldn't uh, bring in or generate any more false profits. Yeah, and that is a very extreme example of going behind the numbers. Tom, for folks who want to learn more about you and how they can connect with you and find the podcast network, what's the best way to do that? Sure, Dave. So the Compliance Podcast Network can be found at www.compliancepodcastnetwork.net. Uh, we post six to eight shows daily on the network. If you want to reach out to me, I'm available on LinkedIn, Thomas R. Fox. You can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Great. Thank you for that. I want to talk about the, uh, the use of data, analytics, artificial intelligence, and how all of those things play into the compliance space. Sure. So data analytics uh, was really late coming to the compliance arena. I really uh, attribute that to the fact that most compliance lawyers like myself are recovering lawyers in some way, shape or form. The Department of Justice is the primary regulator in the compliance realm. And they're of course lawyers. They're also prosecutors, they're not regulators. Also the Securities and Exchange Commission. So uh, starting in about 2015, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission started talking about data analytics. That happened uh, and that, it really uh, moved forward from there. Gotcha. Where do you see artificial intelligence playing a role in compliance? Artificial intelligence, like every other business process, will be critical going forward. We still have the problem of if you put something in, it, you've lost intellectual property protection. Uh, but also what many in the compliance realm are trying to do is to create sort of a dedicated compliance large language model that can be utilized. All right, Tom, we're going to have to take a quick break here to pay a few bills. Don't you go anywhere. Folks watching and listening, we'll be right back on Behind the Numbers after this quick break. Have you ever tried to build people into a team? Maybe you've tried bowling or zip lining or paintball or pizza making. These events can be fun and they can make everybody happy for a while. But in the long run, do they really turn people into a team? Now, imagine the members of your team scattered all over the world working from trains and airplanes, from remote offices, client locations, or working from home. How do you build a winning team when your playing field might be the entire world? With BCAT, we've created the answer. Working completely online, no matter where your people are, we turn them into an engaged and motivated team in three simple steps. First, we use the BCAT survey, which they can take online, anywhere, anytime, to reveal the North Star, that represents their shared pride in the work they do. Next, we work with your team's leaders and stakeholders to convert that North Star into a role target, an ideal virtual person who represents your team's best self, living its best day at work. With our internet tools, we hang your North Star high in the sky where everyone on your team can see it, 
no matter where in the world they might be. Then we guide and help everyone on your team in creating personal plans to align themselves with your team's North Star. We help each of them develop the positive habits that, day by day, every day, steer them closer to your North Star, aligning themselves with your team's signature dreams and ideals. And over the long haul, we offer programs and coaching techniques that help them stick to their plans. Remote team building isn't hard. It doesn't take long. And it's just as much fun as pizzas and paintball. You build winning teams around a purpose, not a place. BCAT is the answer. To build a highly functional virtual team, contact us at info at getbcat.com or call 1-855-999-BCAT-2228. And welcome back to Behind the Numbers, everyone. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and we are talking all things compliance with Tom Fox, who's the founder of the Compliance Podcast Network. Tom, before we had to go to commercial break, we were talking a little bit about the use of data, analytics, AI, and I think that's a, a great jumping off point to talk about something that you alluded to in the first segment, which is how compliance can make business more efficient and more profitable. Let's unpack that. Sure. So let me just start off by saying, uh, I, before the break, I started about the, top, uh, the start of the data analytics conversation in compliance. That really ramped up during the pandemic and it's going full speed, uh, almost hyperspace here post pandemic. That has been driven by the regulators in the form of the Department of Justice. We've had two recent enforcement actions where they have made clear that data analytics uh, the implementation of a data analytics program by companies who violated the FCPA was a key factor in those companies receiving a discount on their overall fine and penalty. The uh, Department of Justice has hired the former top chief compliance officer who implemented a corporate data analytics program for compliance to help the Department of Justice uh, and their data analytics uh, own program. So the regulators are focused on that. What uh, the compliance officer needs to focus on is two things, access to the data, and then two, understanding what it means. Now, I want to pick on myself because once again, I'm a lawyer. I can barely add two plus two. So I know where the data is, but somebody's going to have to get it. And that means IT. That means an external resource. That means my CISO. Uh, may, may be my chief technology officer. So I have to have a conversation. With you. But two, what does it mean? Uh, can I come to someone like you and have you explain it to me? Do I need a data scientist to explain it to me? How about if I just look for anomalies? I set a A and a Z point. Below A, I investigate. Above Z, I investigate. Everything else is within a reasonable range based upon my overall risk assessment. I'd like to point to a couple of examples uh, where data can be utilized in ways far beyond compliance, really leading to this increased business efficiency. Uh, and these are both public, so I can talk about them. Uh, a company yeah. was going to do what you and I would call a straight fraud risk analysis of business uh, development employees, gift travel and entertainment spend. So they went to a business unit. And they were looking for, it was $75 limit before you had to get pre-approval. So they, um, and they were looking for the, you know, split receipts, receipts of $74.99, all of the traditional fraud indices. What they found was something very different, Dave. They found that to get a contract, and it was a, a geographic region, the business development people had to spend some amount of money. The government officials or uh, other customers wanted to be wined and dined to create a relationship. Nothing wrong with that. That's a standard part of business. But the most interesting thing they found was that there was some point at the high end where it became clear that it didn't matter how much money you spent on the customer. They were not going to sign a contract. Uh, whether that customer, you know, enjoyed being taken to dinner, enjoyed gifts, travel, entertainment, whatever it may be. So the company said to this business unit, business development people, you have to spend A and you can't spend above Z. Well, they thought that the business people would go nuts. Well, it turned out the business people loved it because it gave them a metric. 
by which they could understand I'm at Z. I don't think this customer's going to sign a contract. I'm going to go to the next one. So they were able to compress their sales cycle and reduce their overall gift travel and entertainment spend. Uh, that was an insight which they were, of course, not expecting at all. Uh, the second is under the FCPA, that law I referenced, um, there is some risk in paying for travel of government officials. It can be managed, but there is some risk in a large uh, HVAC manufacturing company uh, had previously brought foreign government, uh, and this was a company, not a home air conditioning unit, but like a country club or a building or, or a, you know, a whole series of units for structures, that size construction. They would bring foreign officials to their manufacturing plant in the United States to show them their manufacturing. And they would pay for the travel and they would pay for all uh, rooming and lodge while those people were in the United States. Now, this was a legitimate business expense, certainly acceptable under the FCPA, but they decided to discontinue the program. They still would allow customers to come to the United States, but they wouldn't pay for their travel or their stay in the U.S. Well, what they found was their entire customer base who came to the U.S. changed, and it changed in the following. The people who came were invested in the HVA systems, and they were usually decision makers who had contract signing authority. Previously, it was viewed as a boondoggle to come to the United States because all expenses were paid. So once again, the company found they had a higher quality of customer. They had customers who were motivated to sign contracts so that they could make sales. And the, the travel and expense for all of that was literally in seven figures. So there was actually a significant savings. Once again, this was a response to a perceived compliance risk, but the change uh, actually made the business more efficient and more profitable. So uh, it's, um, that's the thing that is perhaps the most striking about when compliance starts looking at data. You get these ancillary insights that are really business process insights, and that's why I've tried to articulate that effective compliance equates to more efficient business process, emphasizing that it's a business process. Yeah, and those are great anecdotes there because when you talked about, especially the uh, the business development story, that that's kind of a counterintuitive argument that I would have expected to come out of that. So fascinating stuff, and I appreciate you sharing that data. Um, we're getting close to the, the end here, unfortunately, Tom, down to the short strokes, but I want to ask you one more thing about um, compliance and, and how important it is for companies that are trying to attract capital and investors? It, it is absolutely mandatory. Uh, I'm going to pick on Houston because Houston is the FCPA enforcement capital of the world. More companies in Houston have gone through FCPA enforcement actions than any other city on earth, and it's because of energy. Well, the business response in Houston was, if you want to do business with one of the big boys, Shell, Exxon, Oxy, whoever it may be, you had to have a compliance program in place and every level down, literally to, I represented a company that had a $15 million market cap on one piece of software that did something down hole. And I kept telling these guys, if we don't have a compliance program, you're not going to get any investment money, whether it's a customer, whether it's a private equity, whatever it may be. They let me finally put a compliance program in place and literally two weeks later, uh, a large uh, customer came and said, we want to invest in your company. And the second thing they wanted to see after the financials was the compliance program. It, it's a long-winded way of saying, if you want dollars, whether it be investment dollars, whether it be a bank loan, whether it be insurance for risk management, whether it be a joint venture partner, whether you want to make a sale, you're going to have to have a compliance program, particularly if you're in a high-risk industry. Well said. Before I let you go, I'm going to give you one final chance to tell the audience how they can find you and learn more about your podcast since we didn't get a chance to go deep on that one. Sure. Uh, Compliance Podcast Network is at www.compliancepodcastnetwork.net. You can reach me uh, at tfox at tfoxlaw.com or connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to visit with you. That's great, Tom. I can't thank you enough for joining us today on Behind the Numbers. Dave, it's really been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for what you do. You betcha. We've been talking compliance with Tom Fox, who's the founder of the Compliance Podcast Network. 
My name is Dave Bookbinder and I'm the one that my clients turn to when they want to know what their most important assets are worth. If you're a business owner and you don't know the value of your business, we should talk. You can find me on LinkedIn. I want to thank the Big Cheese for running the board today and also thank you for watching and listening. We can't do it without your support. That's all we have for today, folks. We'll see you next time on Behind the Numbers.